The time I went to West Virginia State and when I went on the campus and attended my first class, that was the first time I had been, been exposed to a black teacher. Because uh, in 1943, Pittsburgh, the Pittsburgh public school system had no black teachers. And, uh, you know, that was, that, and the fact that I went to a school where 90% of the faculty was black, 10% white. That was an entirely different uh, type of setup. In this setting, out there removed, what, 12 or 13 miles from Charleston, the campus contained everything you wanted, you know, in terms of a self-contained. And we were in this kind of, I call it, it and it still is, a nurturing environment. If you took um, all the black players in college basketball, um, put them on all black squads, and out of that, you found a national champion of black basketball. That is what West Virginia State was in 1948. You were taking the best black players in America, and out of that, these guys were the best. We knew we stood on the top floor in basketball, irregardless to color. Well, when I was a little fella in the late 40s and early 50s, uh, I was just in awe of them, of course. Uh, they, were, they were my heroes besides my father. The force behind all of it was our coach, Mark Hanna Caldwell. I never saw it a game, basketball game, without a shirt and tie suit on. Immaculate, shoes just shining everywhere. Uh, never used a curse word, but was a great teacher, forceful. He could get you to understand and to do the things that you that he wanted you to do. In fact, there are several paper articles that would mention the fact that he was a very gentleman coach. He's, I've never heard Daddy say a curse word in my life. I think he was ahead of his time. He was a genius in the field of athletics. Uh, I think he was a very good student of the sport. And the system that the coach put in was a wheel system, which was pretty difficult to defend. You know, a part of going unbeaten, you have to have some luck somewhere <laughs> along the line because, uh, I mean, you get in, in, in the close ball games and of course we played some pretty good teams. We did it through the entire season and through the only championship available to us, the CIAA tournament that was held in Turner's Arena in Washington, D.C. The conference was filled with um, the best black players in the country. One of the things that, that is often forgotten is the greatness of the teams at black colleges at the time because very few black players were recruited by predominantly white schools. When Earl came, Earl Lloyd came to the campus and uh, many of us, a lot of folks, students, had not seen the guy as tall as Earl, six foot five, a basketball player who could do the things that he could do. It's, it's extremely important to be in the right place at the right time. And I came here and as a young 18-year-old, you know, from a small town and, and to a small college. And it, it was just, you know, it was a fit. I mean, I really, I really fit here, you know. Everyone thought Lloyd was naturally super because he was 6'7", six, 6'8", six, and that was unheard of in those days. But Lloyd, we knew it was something special when he came in. The um, 1950 draft, in which Chuck Cooper was drafted by the by the um, Boston Celtics in the second round, so he was the first black player drafted. Earl Lloyd was drafted in the ninth round by the excuse me by the Washington Capitals. The Washington Capitals happened to be scheduled to play on the opening night of the season. They played um, against the Rochester Royals in Rochester, so it was Halloween night, October 31st, 1950, and Earl Lloyd debuted with the Capitals. Well, he had a very, very good career. And then he also was, um, he and a teammate, a black teammate, were the first two black players to play on an NBA uh, title team. 
uh, the, the uh, Syracuse Nationals won the title, I think, in 1955. So they were on that team together. And, and then Earl later became, I think it's the fourth black NBA head coach um, when he was uh, head coach of the Detroit Pistons. And he was a scout for the Pistons and was a TV or radio broadcaster. So he set a lot of firsts. He was a pioneer in a lot of ways in pro basketball. My life would have been totally different without West Virginia State College. And I, I can truthfully say that in my adult career, any and all of the good things that ever happened to me, I can directly trace it back to this college. We had so much talent that it was interchangeable. If one guy wasn't playing well, we had someone capable of stepping right in and doing that particular game, what he wasn't doing. That's the reason why I think we were successful. I think there was as many Michael Jordans as there was anybody else back in those days, but because it wasn't, the timing wasn't right, you see, and I think this might be the thing. And I think even those players ought to understand that they're there because of a team like a West Virginia State. Well, they were able to bring together, at one point in history, a group of young men who were able to have a significant achievement.